Heavenly Father, we just want to, as we take this opportunity to look into your word, as always, as has already been prayed, ask that your Holy Spirit will guide this process and that you will speak to each one of us, including myself, that we can be challenged, encouraged, and prepared to go forward from this day. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So how many of you like to give gifts to other people? Yeah, some, a lot of you don't. Some gift givers. For those of you that like to give, I think probably most people give gifts, but there are different kinds of givers. There are those people who tend to give their gifts just kind of any time they happen to feel inspired to do so. I feel like giving you a gift. Then there are other people who are more gift givers at set regular times. And then there are some people who basically give gifts as seldom as possible. That's another option. But I, I think probably most people or many people I expect tend to focus their gift giving often on set uh, events or occasions. You know, some people tend to give their gifts at, at birthdays or anniversaries or, or graduations or maybe at Christmas or something like that. Other people tend to give their gifts at occasions, graduations, weddings, retirement, special events that are happening. Many people often give gifts to others, but let me ask you another question. What about yourself? When do you give gifts to yourself? Or do you? Do you give gifts to yourself? I heard, yeah, Claudette's hand is way up. I heard her last Sabbath saying she went to do this retail therapy thing. I think that sounds like a gift to myself. When do you give gifts to yourself? Maybe I should add this. Should you? Should you be giving gifts to yourself? Well, you probably wouldn't be surprised if I told you that Jesus is a big giver of gifts, right? Jesus gives gifts. But did you know that Jesus is also a big gift giver to himself? Did you know that? At least in a sense he is. Today, what I would like us to do to consider from the Bible, consider with me the purpose behind these gifts that, interestingly enough, Jesus gives to himself. And to do that, we need to open up the Bible. So if you've got a Bible available to you, find Ephesians chapter 4, because that's where we're going to be. At least that's where I'm going to be. That's where we're going to stay. Ephesians chapter 4 in the New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. I mean, Philippians, Ephesians. I should just stop. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want us to read verse 7 and then jump down to the paragraph that begins at verse 11. All right, and beginning at verse 7, Ephesians chapter 4, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So we're talking about Christ's gift. Now move down to verse 11. Paul here is still speaking about Jesus. Let's just read what he says. This is like this is like part of an insanely long sentence that you could not do in one or two or maybe even three breaths. But let's try to follow it through. Verse 11, it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till... We all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What a sentence. All right now, we're going to try to look at this a bit. We need to keep in mind that throughout this letter to the Ephesians, Paul focuses on the fact that all Christian life, all Christian experience is centered in Christ. And, and if that is the case, if centered in Christ, being in Christ, then he's saying there should be unity. So all through this letter to the Ephesians, we have this theme, this overall theme of unity in Christ. Now verse 15 refers to Christ being the head, 
Back in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Paul has already explained that this body over which Christ is the head is the church. He's the head of his body, the church. But now, where does this idea of Jesus giving gifts to himself, where does, where does that idea come into all of this? Where did I get that from? Well, this passage that we read from Ephesians 4 tells of gifts from Jesus that build up or cause growth to or edify the body. For example, look at verses 11 and 12 again. It says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, and here it is, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice again verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. Here it is. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So both verses 12 and 16 refer to the body of Christ being edified. So we could say then that these gifts that provide for the growth and development of the body, these are really, if you think about it, these are gifts from Jesus to himself. Whose body is he giving it to? His body. They're gifts to himself. But of course, they're only gifts to himself in the sense that he is willing to so intimately and fully connect himself with his people. So Christ's gifts to his body are in reality gifts to his people. He gives gifts to himself, gifts to his people, and it's the same thing. His gifts to him are his gifts to us. And we all get to share in the gifts. It's just a gift-giving bonanza. Okay, so verse 7 refers to Christ's gift. And then verse 11 tells of Jesus himself giving spiritual gifts to allow people to serve in various roles. In fact, these people have not only received special gifts, but what it's saying here is they are actually gifts themselves from Christ to his church. Isn't that cool? So God gives you gifts, and as you receive his gifts and use those gifts, you actually become a gift. Back to the other people who have received gifts. So you're getting gifts, you're giving gifts, you're just writing this gift-giving thing. But why specifically are these gifts given? That's what I want us to think about. How are they to be used by the church? What are they supposed to do? What are they supposed to accomplish? Have you ever received a gift from someone and you didn't know what it was for? You didn't know how it worked? Have you ever got a gift like that? Someone gave you a nice gift and you're like, thank you? What is this? Has that happened? Happened to a bunch of people in first service. You guys must be smarter. Some gifts are kind of obvious, right? I mean, if someone gives you a pair of socks, you should probably be able to figure out what to do with that gift without having to read the instruction manual. Have you ever got an instruction manual with socks? Open the open end, stick it over your toe. No, I mean, you can figure that out, right? But not all gifts are like socks. Some gifts are a little, you know, not so easy to figure out. So I brought a gift with me this morning, a gift that I got many years ago from my grandmother, who is no longer alive. But she, my grandmother lived in British Columbia, but she bought this gift. It was a Christmas gift that she bought for me uh, one time when she was visiting my parents, who at the time lived in Peterborough. So she had come for a few months to spend with my parents. And so my mom was able to tell me about the process of my grandmother getting this gift for me. Uh, my grandmother at that time was, she was quite elderly, she was not doing well, she wasn't in good health, she wasn't feeling very good. That particular time she was feeling pretty sick. And she could have just like given my parents some money and said, buy something for Darren, my grandson. But she specifically, if you knew my grandma, she wasn't feeling well, but she wanted to go out shopping. She actually likes shopping. And she, but she wanted to specifically look around and pick out a gift for me. So this is special, right? Because it's not just like, oh, get something for him. She went around looking until she found the gift she wanted to give me. Now, I need a volunteer. So I've noticed at Willowdale, in spite of the number of people there, the only volunteers we ever get are elders who feel sorry for the pastor. <laughs> Nobody's coming up. So ironically, this morning, it was Bernice Thompson who was the, the, um, the volunteer. Thank you, Edwin. Seriously. Now, this is the gift from my grandmother. Would you like to see it? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to show it to you. Okay, so I'm just going to take it out of the box. 
because at least you came up. You could be seeing this gift, but you didn't come up. Okay, so I'm going to show you my nice. gift there. D thank you. You know what he said? He said nice. Isn't that nice? I don't know what it is, but it, it looks good. What did you say? You don't know what it is? Well, it looks really good. It looks good? Yes. <laughs> That's perfect. Yes. This wasn't planned, but I really appreciate our elders for working this in so well. Okay, so I was going to have you tell me, whisper in my ear, what it... No, don't show them yet. You came up here. I was going to have you tell me what it is, but you already said you don't know what it is, right? It's a little desk? Okay. All right. That's good. That's all I needed. You have done perfectly. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. You can't have it. It's my gift. Would you like to see this? Good. I would be very sad if you said no. This is my gift. It really is a very special gift to me because it was, you know, specifically picked out by my grandmother. So I'm, I'm very glad, Edwin, that you said what you said. That was perfect. It was not planned. But would you say this is beautiful? He said it's very nice. Do you think this is beautiful? So I would be embarrassed probably to tell you if it had just been me. But this was the deal. That particular year, we were spending Christmas with Sandra's family. One year, we go to my family to um, Ontario. One year, we go to her family, Alberta, later BC. We lived in Saskatchewan. This year, we were at Sandra's family. And the way, the way we do gifts um, is, is it's not a quick affair. Like, we're not like everybody rip and tear and open up. Oh, no, that drives me crazy. We open one gift at a time, systematically, carefully, and we all give due attention to that gift, acknowledge that gift, express our thoughts and appreciation about that gift, and then we move on to it. It takes us forever, and I like it. That's how it should be. So we were doing that. that I don't know if your family used to do that, but once she married me, like, I'm not doing it any other way. So we were there, all our brothers and sisters and their families and everybody, and the time came, they gave this gift. Oh, this is from Darren's grandma, that's nice. And we opened it up, and we're like, wow, that's nice. That's, that's really beautiful. And we're like, what is it? <laughs> Nobody knew. We passed it around, everybody looked at it. Like, I don't know. Edwin said it's a desk, maybe. I don't know. Paperweight, card, well, that's what we thought, right? We passed it around and we said, well, maybe it's like a business card holder, right? But if you look at it, you just look at it and you look at the distance between the posts, we're like, no way, it can't be a business card holder unless it was a very odd business card because you just put the card there and it just flop over. So, but we all agreed that it was beautiful. Very nice. I'm very thank, you know, thank you, Grandma, whatever it is. So, you know, we finished our vacation there. We went home, and I had this gift from my grandma. And it was kind of awkward because I knew I needed to, like, call her up or write her or something and tell her thank you. And I didn't know what to say. Thank you for that beautiful gift. I'm going to use it to... I don't know really what I'm going to do with it. Hold down papers or something. So I got it home. I had to do something. So one day I thought, well, maybe I should try. Watch this. I still can't believe this works. This is my business card. Is it a business card if you're a pastor? This is my card. Oh. Look! It doesn't make sense to me because when I pull it out, that's way too far apart for a business card. That is smaller than that. That's what my brain says, but perfect fit. This is my card holder that I finally found again since we moved to uh, Ontario. So now I'm going to use it, probably at home. If I use it in my office here at the church, I might not see it again for many years and get buried. Very nice gift. I'm very thankful to my grandmother for giving me that gift. But who would have guessed, certainly not me, that it was a card holder? And isn't it true that gifts are only really useful? They're really only valuable mostly if we know what they're for. You have a gift, but you're like, what do I do with it? What's the point? Which should bring us back to Ephesians chapter 4 and these gifts that Jesus gives to his church. What are they for? Oh, God gives us gifts. Yes, amen. Who cares, really, if we don't know what they're for? How do we use them? And the answer is not a mystery. The answer is found actually in verse 12 of Ephesians 4. It's like the instruction manual that comes with the Lord's gifts. It's not like figure it out. It's like here it is. I don't know how you are, 
what your personality is like when it comes to reading instructions. I know some people don't read instructions unless they have to. Not me, man. I am like systematic. I read the instructions, which is why I have so many things I've bought that are still unopened years later because I don't have time to read them. But I, I read through like the electronic warnings and everything. I don't even know what that stuff means. The, the FCSA guidelines or something. I don't even know. I just feel like I better read that stuff so I know. I read the instructions. I go over them point by point. And to some degree, if we're going to understand God's gifts, we need to do that a little bit more closely. So let's look at the instructions God gave here. First of all, it says these gifts that God gives are for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So let's start with that word equipping. The Greek word here that is translated equipping means a perfectly adjusted adaptation or a complete qualification. We're talking about qualifications for service in preparation for our account meeting. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, the verb on which this word is based is used in this phrase, that you be perfectly joined together. In Matthew 4 21, the same verb refers to mending fishing nets. And I think that idea of fishing nets might be helpful to us to understand what this is talking about. Think about a fishing net. If you have a torn, disconnected fishing net, how much use is that going to be? Not much for catching fish, right? Fish will be, ooh, look at this net I can swim through. Oh, I don't know what fish think, but I mean, it's not going to help you catch fish if it's all torn apart, right? If there's big holes in it. It has to be reconnected if it's messed up. It has to be reconnected in the right places to be suitable and strong enough to effectively catch fish. And here in Ephesians 4 verse 12, the saints, it's saying, are prepared and fit and united and lined up in the proper order and connected together to do the work of ministry. They receive the training and the tools and the abilities needed to completely qualify them for the Lord's work. And by the way, in case you're thinking, well, this doesn't really apply to me because this is talking about the saints well, let me clarify. I have some news for you. Saints are not just dead people who we remember as living perfectly pious lives. That's not what saints are. The term translated saints simply means holy ones. They are not those who are perfectly sinless. They are those who are separated from the common ways to follow God's holy ways. So the saints are simply God's people. Guess what? You're surrounded by them. There's saints all around you right now. Some sinners too, but a bunch of saints. The saints are God's people, including those who are living right now. In fact, back in the first verse of this letter, if you read how it begins, that's how Paul addressed the Christians to whom he wrote. He called them saints. He wasn't writing to dead people. He was writing to living Christians. So the saints are equipped for what? What does it say? For the work of ministry. You see, Christ gives these gifts to the church so that all Christians can be involved in ministry. Did you catch that? All Christians, every Christian, every member of the body of Christ is supposed to be a minister. And sometimes we refer to that, that thinking by the terminology, the priesthood of all believers. We're all to be a minister, a priest. Does that sound kind of scary? For some people, like, minister is the last thing they want to be. I don't want to be a minister. I don't want to be married to a minister. I didn't sign up for that. Mm-mm. Every member being involved in the work of ministry. If that sounds kind of scary, don't worry. Because we could change that and it would mean the same thing if we said every member being involved in the work of service or serving. That's all it really means. That's what the word means. The, the word, you might be interested to know that the Greek word here translated for ministry is the Greek word diakonias. It's from the root of this word that we get the English terms deacon and deaconess. In a sense, every Christian should be a deacon and a deaconess. Uh, uh, someone who serves. Every Christian is supposed to be active in ministry, in serving Christ. That's what it's talking about. So in her classic book on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages, author Ellen White makes an interesting point in this regard. She's referring to that time, you might remember how Jesus instructed his disciples to come apart and rest for a while. And then that she, she notes that when Jesus told them that the harvest was great, but the laborers are few, remember that? It's interesting what he said to them next. He wasn't calling them to engage in ceaseless toil. He didn't say there's lots of work and hardly anybody to do it, so go out there and kill yourself till you expire and get it done. That's not what he said. 
What did he say? He instructed them to pray and ask the Lord of the harvest to send out more laborers. He didn't say, just go try to do it and it's impossible. He said, pray that there will be more people involved in this. And then she says this, after describing that, she says, God has appointed to every man, really every man and every woman, his work according to his ability. And he would not have a few weighted with responsibilities while others have no burden, no travail of soul. And right in the middle of that sentence, in parentheses, she puts a reference to Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. She's not just talking about paid employees and ordained pastors here. She's saying this work of ministry has to be shared among everybody. That's what the Bible says. As Christian members of the body of Christ, we are given different spiritual gifts. We have different abilities. And frankly, we carry different responsibilities. We serve in different roles and functions. We have different levels of responsibility. But because of the gifts of Christ, we must all be active in service or ministry. And yet there always seem to be some people in the body that think differently, that think, yeah, that's generally true except for in my case. Well, guess what? In the body, we've got all kinds of parts, right? Bones and organs, and there's parts we see and parts we don't see that only the medical people see. Inside of us, we've got all this stuff. But we've also got something in our body that we call the appendix, right? Humans have an appendix. What's it for? Nobody knows. What happens if something goes bad with your appendix? What do they do? Take that thing out. Get rid of it. And what happens to your life if they take out your appendix? Nothing. I mean, unless they do a really bad job. But I mean, as far as we know, you're okay, right? You go on like normal without your appendix. What's that thing for? Well, that's where Christ's body is different than human bodies because there is no appendix in the body of Christ. Christ's body doesn't have an appendix. There is no provision, in other words, to join and just sort of hang out there, just sort of be there. Don't really know why you're there, but you're there. God gives gifts both to you and to your fellow members, and these gifts are intended to prepare and qualify you to be an active as a servant in God's work. So to claim that God's work of ministry has no use for you then becomes very serious. You're now denying Christ's gifts. You're actually saying that his body doesn't work. But is that really true, that principle? That God gives gifts to everybody in the body and every single person has a work of ministry. Is that really true? Yeah, we say it's true. But if you think it through in practical terms, is it really true? Because I think about some people where it's, it's kind of harder to figure that out. Right? What about the elderly person who's confined to a bed? Still true for that person? What about the person suffering from some form of dementia? Maybe Alzheimer's or something like that. What about that person? Still active serving in ministry? What about the person whose body is paralyzed by a disease, something like multiple sclerosis? Does this principle still play out for such a person in the body of Christ? Does their sickness eliminate them from the body of Christ because they can't function as maybe they once could or perhaps they never could? Is there a place and a function in the body of Christ for such a person? Or do we say, well, the principle applies if things are going pretty good for you? Or does the principle apply across the board? Are the gifts of Jesus no longer able to equip such people for the work of ministry? It's actually an important question because if this principle is true, it kind of needs to be true across the board, right? So my father, when he was, I think, in his early 30s, when I was in grade one and two, he had a brain tumor. They finally found this brain tumor that he had. When they found it, he said, like, if we, don't, if we didn't find this, you wouldn't have lived more than three or four more days. So very serious, right? Now they would find it easily with the technology that they have. Couldn't find this thing. It was sick for a long time. They finally found it. And they're like, whoa, this is serious. If it's malignant, you're dead. If it's not malignant, we can try to take it out. Thankfully, it wasn't malignant. So they had a surgery at McMaster University to remove that tumor. Um, 17 brain surgeon interns watching that surgery because they had just learned how to do it that year, the first time they'd ever seen it done. So it was a pretty big deal, this surgery. Big deal for our family. So going into that surgery, they said, no promises, 
They said, even if we get the tumor out, you might be completely paralyzed. Half of your body might be completely paralyzed. You might be partially paralyzed. But there's one thing they said we know is going to happen. There's one thing we're going to do, and we know this up front. We are going to have to cut the nerve to your right ear because that tumor is all wrapped around that nerve and there's going to be no way to get it out without cutting off your uh, right ear nerve. So thankfully, my dad came through that surgery. He's 80 years old now. He was here a few weeks ago. Um, thankfully, that tumor was benign and they were able to get that out and he was left with partial paralysis. But overall, I grew up with my dad and I'm thankful for that. But you know what? He can't hear. Can't hear out of his right ear. Completely deaf in that ear since the day of that surgery. His ear has absolutely no ability to hear. But you know what? I have never once in all the years since, like the last 50 years since I was a little kid, I have never heard my dad even consider the idea of going in and just having them cut that ear off. Just get rid of it. Right? Because what are ears meant to do? Good, you're way ahead of first service. Ears are meant to hear. That's why we have ears, right? They're meant to hear. My dad's ear can't hear. It's of no, he doesn't just hear a little bit of ears, nothing from it. So why have that ear? Why carry it around? How many people want to carry around extra weight? Why doesn't it just get rid of it? You don't have to comb your hair around it. Well, for one thing, I think generally people look better with both of their ears on. I know some people do lose their ears, and some people maybe aren't born with ears, but in general, human beings, we kind, of, we kind of expect them to have an ear on both sides, right? So I think one reason my dad doesn't cut it off is because it would, it would look kind of different. It's kind of nice to have an ear on both sides there. And there's even a function to this. You know, before my dad went into that surgery, he didn't wear glasses. After that surgery, he's worn glasses ever since. Lately, he should wear glasses more, but he doesn't. But he still has to have reading glasses. And there's one thing I've observed over the years is his ear is actually helpful on the right side because when he puts his glasses on, that ear is a place where he can hook the right arm of his glasses. Otherwise, he'd be like, like this all the time, right? Or something like that. Which brings me back to those who have lost some or all of their physical or mental ability. Are they still able to be of service to God? Because that's... That's something that's given me a lot of thought, right? If this principle is true, it's got to be true for everybody, even those that aren't doing so well. So as I think about that, can they be of service to God? I believe so. I believe in some cases people may be able to be powerful in prayer in a way that maybe they couldn't be. People whose mind is good, but their body isn't so good, maybe they have some more time and the ability to have more focus, to really focus on prayer and be powerful in prayer in a way they couldn't if everything was going okay. Maybe people in these situations are able to be powerful witnesses of what true faith and courage and peace in the midst of pain or trials is like. And I think for some of these people, maybe they can even in those situations be used of God to provide another member of the body with an opportunity to use his or her gifts in caring for them. I don't think God strikes people down so that there, someone else can care for you, but God's a, a master at taking bad situations and still bringing good out of it. And if we're all doing okay, you know what humans do? We think, oh, we're okay, we're pretty good, we can take care of everything. But when I have to help someone else, that's good for me. And maybe, maybe God can even work through some of these people's experiences of suffering to help remind the rest of us about the sick reality of sin's effects and how dependent we are on him. Because it's not always fair, right? The people that get sick and that lose their capacity, physical or mental or otherwise, it's not always like, oh, they were bad people, so this is what's happened. It doesn't make sense. It's all over the map. It's not fair. Welcome to planet Earth. And we as humans start thinking, no, you know, we got this all under control. When our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ face those unfair things, then we are left with that reminder that this should not be our final home. Man, we don't have it all figured out. This world is nice, but it's not so nice. And it reminds us we need to be dependent. Maybe God can even work through those people to help build us up, even through their experience of pain. Not caused by God, but used by God. So as Christians, are we prepared and enabled to work for Jesus through his gifts to us? 
Because each of us is given not only the individual spiritual gifts and abilities he's given to us, but to each of us is given also the gift of the ministry of the others in his body, the others in the church. So how does Christ's gift of others in the body help equip us for our work of service? Well, this is how it works. When others serve in the church with the gifts that they've been given, that can be of encouragement to us. When I see you, you see me using God's gifts, that should encourage us, challenge us, motivate us. It can teach us, it can train us, it can guide us. We can share in those experiences together. We can share in planning together. This thing wasn't meant to be in isolation, like little islands disconnected from one another. Their ministry provides a framework into which, in cooperation, we can weave and connect our own complementary work of ministry. It is like a fishing net. It's not separate little pieces, it's connected together. Now, in verse 11, Paul specifically mentions Christ's gifts to the church of people who function in important roles of leadership that probably generally carry greater responsibility. And it's quite possible, if not probable, that these and other leaders in the church probably have a greater influence on the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. That's just kind of naturally going to happen. But while leaders and people with special gifts may have greater responsibilities, they may have broader influence, It's still true that the ministry of each member of the body is important and needed. The the, the principle here is, oh, that guy is so important and does so much stuff, it doesn't matter what I do. The Bible says, no, that's wrong. It does matter what you do. You are important. You may not have the same responsibility or role or influence, but you are just as important. So all active Christians become part of this ongoing, interconnected cycle of gifts and ministry where we're blessed by the Lord's gifts which enable us to work for Him, we in turn actually become a gift from Him to the rest of the body. Isn't that neat? You're a gift. God gave you gifts so that you can be a gift. We're gifts to one another. we got gift giving going on all over the place here. It becomes a cooperative exchange in which we both give and receive encouragement for the work of ministry. And what the Bible is saying, what Paul is saying is that's unity in Christ. When we are using those gifts together, that's how we become united. Do we become united because we all like the same kind of music? We all dress the same way? (laughs) That's never going to happen. That's not what's going to bring unity. What brings unity is when we're using our gifts together that God has given us as gifts to one another. All right, but then why does Jesus want all Christians to be active in the work of ministry anyway? What is the point of all this work? Why can't we just relax? Why? Is God capable? Can God do stuff? God's God's pretty capable. He's pretty talented. He's pretty powerful. And he's got all these angels, right? Hosts of angels, however many that is. They can do amazing things. Things that you and I can't do. So why do we have to be busy working? God can get her done. Angels can get her done. Why can't we relax? What is the point of all this work? Maybe it's just to kill time, is that it? God knows that all those people, if they're not doing something, they're gonna get in trouble, so let's keep them busy, let's keep them occupied. Is that what God is doing? Is this work just an end in itself? Let's just work to work because we should work because we like work? No, not at all. You know, it's the last part of verse 12 that reveals the ultimate goal to which all Christian ministry and service should be directed, and here's what it says. Why all this work? For the edifying of the body of Christ. Jesus enables Christians to be active in the work of service in order that the church, his body, might be built up. Edify, that's what it means, might be built up. How far are we supposed to take that? Like, do we ever get a break? Do we get to retire from this thing? How far are we supposed to take this process of building up the body? Well, until the church reaches the condition that's described in verse 13. You still got Ephesians 4 there? Look at this one more time. How long does this thing go on? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How high would I have to go? to be the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm too short, right? How do we get to that level? In other words, this is a very high ideal, an ideal that I suggest the church will never completely arrive at until Christ arrives to take his church, the bride, home. We're never going to get to the point, I don't think, on this earth, we're like, good enough, good enough, it's done, we're perfect, look at us. 
all buff and built up. I think it's an ongoing process because I've yet to see the church fully, perfectly represent Christ. I sure don't see it in myself. So the church will always have a need of being further built up. The body of Christ must always be growing, always developing, always maturing. And thus the work of ministry never ceases. You don't retire from it. The church is built up in two main ways. It's, it's built up when there's growth and development of the current members, when they grow in spiritual maturity, when they grow in character. You know, as we get better, more like Christ, that's the way the church is built up. That's one way. The other way is in the addition of new people into the body. I can't add new people into my body, right? I'm going to get stronger because I'm going to take that guy's arm and put it in me. No, I can't do that. But in Christ's body, we can. We not only build up what's there, but we can actually invite other people in, and the body gets bigger and better that way. And that means that if our work of ministry is truly aimed at building up the church, it has to involve both service to those within the body and reaching out to those outside of the body. Both aspects have to be a part of every Christian service for God. Some of us, we really like to be with the folks in the church and we like to make them better and that's great, but if I'm never doing the other part of the body building, I'm kind of missing the point. And there's some people that really could care very little about the people who are here and don't, like, you're done with you guys, I'm going out there. But if you're done with these guys and only going out there, you're missing the point. That's not building up the body. Both aspects are there. So then the ultimate challenging question that must come to us out of Ephesians 4 verse 12 is this. Brother and sister, fellow Christian, as a Christian, as a member of the body of the Christ, are you serving as a builder? The question I need to ask myself, you should ask yourself, are we serving as builders? Are we builders? Or you're a builder, right? In the... In the the, the build it, the house thing. But are we all builders in a spiritual way? Are we builders? Are you using your spiritual gifts? And not just that, if so, how are you using them? Are you serving Jesus in a way that edifies the church? Ephesians 4.12 calls for every single Christian to be active in a work of ministry that builds up the body of Christ. Question is, are we, are you, am I serving as a builder? And if I really want to know the answer to that, I have to, I have to look at three components. Don't worry, they're not long. But there's three things that have to happen for me to be able to say, yes, I'm a builder. I'm a builder for Jesus. First thing is you must accept the gifts and the role that God has given you. Realize that your service for God is not always tied to a church office. You may hold no church office. But you could still be using your gifts in the work of ministry for him. Do you know that the vast majority of Willowdale church members hold no church office? Does that mean all those people aren't using their gifts? I certainly hope not. Likewise, on the other hand, simply having a church office is no automatic guarantee that your gifts will be put to use in active ministry. Just because you're the head this or the coordinator of this or the director of this department, that doesn't automatically mean you're using your gifts as a builder. We hope that the division of church offices that we have and all this process we go through and nominating committee and all of this stuff, we hope that that provides coordinated opportunities to help assist members be active in service, but it's not tied to a church office. So first of all, the first thing, you have to accept the fact that as a Christian, God has called you to active ministry. Maybe it's leadership ministry. Maybe it's behind-the-scenes kind of ministry. That's really up to God, the Holy Spirit. Second point. You have to make use of and accept the gift of the ministry of others. You have to be willing to learn from the experiences and the expertise, and I would say even the, the, the mistakes of the other people in the body. You need to recognize your need of their encouragement, their support. It's not all about you and your gifts, just me and Jesus. Nobody knows it all, right? Nobody, yes, that is true. God has not given, there is no spiritual gift, no fruit of the spirit of know-it-all. God gives nobody the gift of know-it-all. Some of the scariest people I've ever met in life are the people that know everything. These people frighten me because I know they don't know everything and sometimes they display it quite clearly. But in their mind, they know everything. God does not give that gift to a single person. The only one close would be Jesus. Nobody knows it all. Paul speaks of the gift of those who are apostles and prophets. What about that? 
Where are they today? Where are all our apostles and prophets? Where are all these people? Well, you know, as I think about that, I don't know. But I think probably we don't really have the same intense need for such leaders among us today as they probably had back in the days of the early church. You know why? Because today we have what they did not have. We, we have ridiculous amounts of data. We have access, instant access to stuff all over the world and cataloged for years. We can read books and read magazines and watch live things around the world and by satellite and through the internet and we have training materials galore of right now media. We have so much stuff going on in this conference since I've been here. There's hardly a weekend that there isn't some training thing going on not too far from here to help give us ideas, give us ministry um, options, give us tools. We've got resources. We have got so much stuff. We've got the Bible accessible to us in almost any language there is. We can just call it up instantly. We can compare it. We have software that will do all the hard work of figuring it out for you. We don't have to go back and forth. We've got so much stuff. And besides that, we also, along with our access to the Bible and the inspired writings of the apostles and prophets in our own language usually, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we have the whole body of inspired writings of Ellen White. So, so we've got so much available to us. It's it's very hard for us to really legitimately have the excuse, you know, Lord, I want to do something, but there's, I don't know, I, I, there's nothing out there to use. There's no resources. I don't know to where to get any information. Yeah, if you live in the jungle somewhere, maybe on the other side of the earth, but really here, that's kind of a, it's kind of a lame excuse. We got so much stuff. We got, frankly, more stuff than we know what to do with. We've got expertise of leaders in every field of ministry. They've recorded information. We can... We can watch it, we can read it, we can rewatch it, we can stop it, we can get all of the notes. We don't have to even take notes. They'll just, boom, send you all of the PowerPoint slides. So to be able to serve as a builder, we have to be willing to equip others by making use of God's gift of encouragement, support, and guidance in the ministry of other believers. Number three, finally, if you want to know that you're truly serving as a builder, you must be willing to do your work of ministry in a way that builds up the body of Christ. This is important. What does that mean? It means more than simply serving in the area to which God has fit you and called you. It's not good enough to just use your gifts. It's how and where you do it. It means being willing to serve in your area of ministry in a cooperative, unified way with the rest of the body. That doesn't mean you have to do exactly what everyone else is doing or do it the exact same way they're doing it. But it does mean that your service for God has to complement and enhance the service of the other members of the church. In other words, your ministry shouldn't run in opposition to the overall goals and plans of the church. It shouldn't be in competition with it. Rather, it should support them. So your ministry, your service of God won't compete with, won't tear down the ministry of another. If you've got your own ministry going and you're doing your own thing and you're just out there and you're like, I don't care about the church or the, I'm going to do better than the church, you're, you're, you're not serving God. You're serving somebody or something, but you're outside of the realm of what these gifts are for. So the question is, does your service for God build up and enhance the body of Christ, or does it mostly just ignore the rest of the body and go its own way? According to Ephesians 4.12, our work of ministry is intended by Jesus to build up his body, the church, because there's really no sense equipping yourself, wasting God's gifts and your energy on service or ministry that's detrimental to the body. I'm serving God. It's kind of really ruining the church, and I don't even like the church, but I'm serving God. No, you're not. No, you're not. That's not how God works. It comes down to the matter of being willing to serve Jesus in the context of the unity of his body. That's the only type of service that Jesus is interested in. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say, ministry that doesn't build up the body is not of service to God. It's not ministry. It's not ministry. It can be a misuse or abuse of God's gifts. So the Christian life, then, in summary, hallelujah, is all about an ongoing, lifelong ministry of building. That's what Christians do. They're builders. And to serve as builders, we must accept God's call to be active in serving Him ourselves. We must accept the value of the gift of the ministry of others in the church. And we must be willing to serve Christ in a way that will help build up His body. So let me ask you again, are you serving as a builder? Are you a builder? Am I a builder? And as you think about that, 
You know, we're preparing for camp meeting. They've asked us to look at these themes. And there's some sections from the book Christian Service. And I want to read this one, one little quote from book Christian Service, page 227, that I think kind of summarizes this well. This idea of how can I be qualified to do service for God? This is what it says there. The laborer for souls needs consecration, integrity, intelligence, industry, energy, and tact. Possessing these qualifications, no man or no man or woman can be inferior. Instead, he or she will have a commanding influence for good. Does it say you have to be an outstanding preacher? Do you have to be able to parse Hebrew verbs? Do you have to be able to teach? Not necessarily. It says you use the gifts God has given you, and that's what qualifies you when you use them in cooperation with the body. So when I think about this in closing, I know you're like, didn't you say that before? Yes, here we are. I want to close with the story of Brother Timothy. I clipped this thing out, I don't know, it's from 1994. I don't know when I clipped it out, sometime after that, maybe then. But this little, this little thing that I look at every once in a while through the years, it always challenges me. And it always encourages me. And I hope it will do that for you. It's uh, written by a man named C. Lloyd Wyman, who at the time he wrote this was the coordinator of the Adventist Evangelistic Association. And he just, he just shall, shares a little um, personal testimony here. He calls it the love we felt. He said, while serving as pastor of a four-church district some years ago, I had an active layman in one of the churches high in the mountains in a small town heavily involved with timber and lumber. Brother Timothy, an elderly man, had a handicap, a cleft palate and a deep scar from his nose to his top lip over which he grew a walrus mustache. Kind of get a picture of him. His articulation was so bad you could not understand him. Yet every year he made friends with others studied with them, brought them to church, and eventually they were baptized. How did he do it? That's what I want to know when I was reading this. What? How did he do it? Here's how. Brother Timothy was very winsome and gently persuasive. When friends asked him to study the Bible with them, he would open the Bible to the texts, point to the right verse, and the people with whom he was studying read the verse. On and on it went like this through the Bible study and through many other Bible studies. The Holy Spirit did the rest. After each study, Timothy would kneel and pray for the people. They could not understand him. They didn't know what he was saying. But tears rolled down his cheeks and off his beard as he pled with God for them. Almost without exception, the people at their baptism would say something like this. What drew our hearts to Jesus and the Word was not just the truth of the Scripture, but the love we felt from Brother Timothy's great heart of love. And that challenges me and encourages me. So Elder Wyman says, If Timothy was able to lead men and women to Christ in spite of his handicaps, what might we do for Jesus with all of the gifts and talents he has so generously given to us? Love is the most important ingredient our love connected to the Holy Spirit's power. What qualifies us to be of service to God? Yeah, it's it's using those gifts and, and sharing with one another and working cooperatively, but it's in that basis of love, right? So are you serving as a builder? If you are, may God continue to bless you and keep going, keep going, keep going till Jesus comes. And if you're not serving as a builder and you claim to be a Christian, I don't know what to say, but to simply ask you, why not? Like, really, why be a Christian and not be a part of this building business? doesn't even make sense. God provides the qualification. We provide the willingness. We get to do it together, and when we do that, we help build up his body. It's beautiful. How better could it be We just got to choose to be a part of it. Let's be builders.